church. Uh, I tell you what, my better half isn't with me, and she's the one that always keeps me focused, so my mind's a little scattered this morning. But uh, she, she's, she's got a little bit of what's been going around. She's feeling a lot better this morning, so but she just decided to keep it to herself. So that's how Malachi's not here either. But uh, before we get started, in a couple ways of announcements, I uh, just want to, uh, if you look at your bulletins, we finally have Ray and Crystal's grandbaby has arrived. Ray Lynn's baby was born, uh, I believe it was on Tuesday, Oliver. So congratulations to them. They're out traveling out to uh, Montana right now. Also, just another announcement, the sign-up for membership is still uh, up in the foyer. So if you would like to become a voting member, please sign up, and we'll be starting those classes the second Sunday in March. Tomorrow, for the women, is the Bible study starts. 10 o'clock in the morning for the morning session, and then 6 o'clock in the evening for the evening session, and it'll be over in the fellowship hall. So looking forward to hearing uh, how that is going. And then this is just in the way of an announcement to March 24th, we're going to be having a church potluck. So just go ahead and put that on your calendars, and we'll probably have a sign up for that later on for dishes to be brought up. And then in a way of announcement also and a prayer request, I just want to make mention, Jen Corbin was taken into the ER last night with uh, some abdominal pain. And so she's currently still in the hospital, currently still at Grove City, but is in the process of going to be getting transferred up to uh, St. Vincent's up in Erie for further evaluation. Um, she seems to be in good spirits. But let's just continue to, she, I know she would desire to be here, and she might even be watching us on her phone, but uh, we just want to make sure that we uh, lift her up in prayer uh, this morning as well. Are, are there any other announcements that would like to be made or mentioned at this time? I would just like to remind everyone that the Operation Christmas Child is still up and running. It never really ends. Um, if you notice, all the winter stuff is on sale right now. Gloves, hats, those are the types of things that we, um, well, you all know what we need, but I just wanted to get a reminder out there that we're still going, so start shopping. <laughs> OCC, we only got, I don't know, when did we start collecting? Uh, November, cool. the collection week is between November, our packing is the 19th to the 24th, somewhere in there. All right, and if you wait till then, it seems like a lot, but if you do a little bit each month, you can pack a lot of boxes. Last, uh, where, where were we at? Where, did we do 100? We did 100. We did 100. So let's beat that. Okay, we can beat that this year. Do you have a monthly theme for what to bring in? Right now, it is the winter supplies, caps and gloves, socks, I believe, was on the list. And I thought about, I think there's an open bulletin board that I could maybe put up a poster with different, like, monthly ideas. That's a good idea. Just go by the month. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Any other announcements I'd like to be made mention right now? All right. If not, would you please stand with me as we open in word of prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can gather together in this place of worship. Father, we come into your sanctuary, and Father, we just ask and seek that your presence would be with us. Quiet our hearts. Father, help us to focus on what your Holy Spirit has for us. Father, we do just think and pause right now and lift up Jen to you. Uh, you see where she's at. Father, I pray that you just put your hand upon her and that you just provide comfort to her. Encourage her and just keep her safe as they're in, in transition. And Father, I just ask that you give the doctors and nurses wisdom. Touch her body. And Father, we do just ask that you meet with us once again in this time of worship. We love you and we praise you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this time and listen to this song as we prepare our hearts for worship.
bulletins for the call of worship. I would like you to read with me, but we're going to do things just a little bit different. Would you please stand with me as we read this? And I'm going to invite you to stand also as we sing the first chorus. So please read with me. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, tremble before him all the earth. This first chorus that we're going to sing is we worship and adore you. And sing it as a prayer. We're going to sing it through actually three times. The first two times we're going to sing it with the, the, the music. And then the third time, I want us to sing it as a prayerful worship song, just with our voices. But if you have your hymnals, please turn to number 194 in your hymnals. You'll find it, or you can watch the screen. But let us sing this song of praise and worship.
who that is. And um, you just realize it just keeps moving on. And it, it's easy to say, well, how long ago was that? And it wasn't um, it was longer than you think. So um, it's helped us to um, appreciate each day and live each day. Yeah. See who that is too. If you, have your, if you want to turn to your songbooks also, you can now turn over to number 383, or if you can follow it on the screen, and this song is entitled, Fill Me Now.
Bless this offering in your name we pray.
to say it's glad to have the, the Florida birds back with us. They, I think they're going to actually help bring some of the warmth this week. All of them. But Tim and Francis, it's good to have them back. I, one announcement that I, I, I failed to mention, and I don't know why I failed it, but tonight, uh, over at Fellowship Manor, they're going to be meeting to sing at uh, 6 o'clock. And if you would like to drive, and it's more recommended because the parking space over there is kind of small. But if you're wanting to go over just to participate and help fellowship and, and sing, um, please be here around 535. The van's going to be leaving at quarter till 6. So uh, for those that are interested in, in helping out with the sing. Um, any other praises or testimony? It's good to know, too, that God is with us even when we are in the ER. With that being said, any other praises or testimonies? Look into the back of the bolts and for the prayer request. There you can see a great number of them. We want to continue to remember Jen uh, as she is going to be transitioning to St. Vincent's. We want to continue to remember uh, Sarah Bowen, uh, the Jeremiah. The little, the little babe that's still in the NICU, um, and he was going to be placed on ECMO. Uh, we have not been able to get on Facebook to see any other updates, but we want to make sure that we continue to pray for little Jeremiah. We want to continue to pray for Gretchen, Helena's daughter. Uh, it looked as all that she had a blood clot. All the labs were pointing that way, and she was having the chest pain, and when she got into the ER, no blood clot at all in the lungs. So we're praising God for that and said maybe a little infection was going on. But they went on ahead and did other scans. No blood clots at all anywhere. So we're praising God for that and just hoping that God will continue to touch her. So, and also we want to continue to pray for Misty. She's going to start undergoing treatment uh, against the Lyme disease and all the other, uh, the mold and everything that she's gotten from being down in the Amazon. So let's just continue to pray for Misty. We do have a praise. Uh, Mary Pavlik had a procedure done, the, the cardiac ablation, and everything went according to plan. There was no complications at all. So we praise God for that. We also want to continue to lift up Nancy Shaluga. She had her first treatment, uh, cancer treatment, and it was it was pretty hard. Um, so we want to just continue to pray for Nancy. Yes, thanks. She has another one this Tuesday, so let's just keep that in there. Yeah, let's, let's just continue to pray for the Shalugas. Um, the tough situation that they're going through. Um, no update on Shana for now. We're just going to continue to pray for this little one that has to have the heart transplant as well. Are there any other updates to these ones or any new ones? Yes. Shelby, Shelby is going to have surgery March 19th, 18th, 18th. Cardiac surgery on uh, March 18th. So she's going to have an ablation done. So we want to continue to remember Shelby as well. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Rose has a relapse. It's viral. Now it's her whole family has it. And Marguerite is now very ill too. Marguerite. Marguerite Bonker. Yes. I talked to her yesterday. So we'll continue to remember Rose and Marguerite. Any others? All right, at this time, if you would stand with me, I'm not going to invite 
opportunity to come forward and lead us in uh, prayer. I'd like to say thank you to the Lord for saving me. Whenever he was asking for testimony, so many times I sort of lay back because I'm trying to be out of the way uh, as much as I can not to. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I'm thankful for his blood. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. That he saved me from my sins and cleansed my heart. I appreciate him so much. And as we look to him in prayer this morning, Let's ask him to help us to worship him. Just bow at his feet in your heart and in your mind. Bow at his feet in his outstretched arms. Father, we come to you this morning in Jesus' precious name. We thank you, O oh God, for the fact that you have given us the invitation to come to you. If you hadn't given us that invitation, we'd be so lost and not knowing what to do or where to turn here on earth. And yet, Lord, you have opened a way for us to call upon your name and to give you thanks and to give you praise and to bless your holy name. We know, O oh God, that as a congregation, we need to draw near to God and we need to call upon your name to, clean, to uh, cleanse our hearts or to uh, make us more worshipful, Lord. We just bow before you this morning grateful for all you've done thankful lord for the answers to prayer that we have seen and father yet continuing to pray and to hold on to the horns of the altar and pray for these dear people that are going through so many things we think of that little baby that's in the uh, icu yet uh, we pray father for uh, sarah bowen's little baby we pray oh god that you would touch that little child and help her in Jesus' precious name. We pray this morning for Jan, Lord, as she is being transferred to Erie. We pray that you'd be with her. We thank you, O oh God. Our hearts rejoice when we see the change in her life and the change in her testimony and the ring to it, Lord. We thank you for Jen's life and her testimony. We pray that you'd be with her and bless her in this time. We thank you for the foster families rejoicing about a safe delivery for Ray Lynn and her baby. We thank you for these things, Lord. We just need you. Uh, there's no way that we can carry on without you. We have a whole list of people, a whole array, and we pray, Lord, that you would touch them each one. We pray, Lord, for those that have been mentioned here this morning the special requests. And we pray, Lord, for the ones that are on the list here that we're praying for continually. We pray, dear Lord, this morning that you would undertake for the New Destiny Center where Lester is working. We pray, Lord, that you would help them, whatever their need is, whatever they need, oh God, we pray that you would bless them because the work that they have done and the work that they need to do is so important and we pray that you would bless them lord and whatever they need may you bless them and help them for jesus sake we pray we pray for uh, the request that merle arblaster made for the one about the surgery on the leg losing the leg we pray father for that prayer request in jesus name that you would answer prayer for them and then, Father, there are many requests here in the congregation that maybe didn't express it. Maybe their hearts are concerned. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's physical. Maybe there's an emotional thing. Maybe there's something going on in our hearts and our lives that, that uh, no one is able to touch, but you are, Lord. And we bring all of these things to you. We lift them before you, and we cry out to you in Jesus' name. We thank you that you're a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. One that doesn't leave us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us today. Touch our hearts, lift our faith, and help us to have our eyes upon you. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor. We thank you for the way you've helped him and blessed him and led him. And we pray that you'd continue to lead him, continue to strengthen him, 
continue to give him the vision that you have for this church and for this people. We pray that you would help us then as a congregation to stand behind him in prayer and, and to cooperate with the programs of the things that God is trying to do in our midst. We pray for all of those requests, Lord, that we can't take time to remember or announce this morning. But you know about them, Father, and we pray that you just slip in there where they are. Lay your mighty hand upon them. And we pray that you'd quiet the spirit of those that need you and a special touch from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless the message this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would touch Luke, touch his heart, and help him to deliver the message that you have given. Help him to have a clear mind and a heart to be able to say and do the things you want him to do. And we'll bless your holy name. And thanks. In your holy name we pray. And amen. 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 Bless his holy name. Thank you. Uh, you may be seated. Thank you. So it says special music. This is going to be very special. Evie, Anna, are you ready? congregation gets the catch of the tune, feel free to join in. We're raising up the next uh, next uh, song leaders here. Because as you can tell, we're, we're running a little uh, between the colds and, and visits. But girls, ready? Well, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have 
right before I, I get into the sermon, we'll have a little bit of a, a children's message, children's illustration. Have to read there, buddy. And what we're going to be going through is they're called resurrection eggs, little Easter eggs, and each one holds just a different story of of the, the Holy Week and the, the resurrection. So, with this first egg, Kate, I'm going to have you open this and tell me what's inside. What, what's inside? What is it? What? A donkey. A donkey. It's a donkey. All right. What what do you think the donkey has to do with the Holy Week of Resurrection? Do you want to listen to Christopher read the Bible verses? Okay. Christopher, go ahead. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them. And he sent them at once. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and brought them and put on them their cloaks. And he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them onto the road. All right. So what happened is on that Palm Sunday, it's a week before Easter, Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now what normally happens, people often back in those days walked from point A to point B. But royalty oftentimes were riding either horses, camels, or, or donkeys. And you see what the people do when Jesus came in? But they were waving palm branches, laying their coats down before Jesus on the donkey, worshiping him as their king. And so that's what the donkey's representing. Oakley, can you open this one? What is it? What do you think it is? It's money. Yep, stands for the 30 pieces of silver. Do you know what the 30 pieces of silver is about? Go ahead, Christopher. <laughs> then one of the 12, whose name was Judas, went to the chief priestess and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? The mic died. Over to, over to you, and they paid him 30 pieces. <coughs> and from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Sorry about that, Christopher. <laughs> so, 30 pieces of silver, that's from Judas. So Judas was one of the 12 disciples, right? But... Was he truly following Christ? You see, he, he had greed. And he had a hard time with greed and selfishness. And so finally, Satan went on ahead and planted a seed in his head. And he went and saw out the, 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 the high priests and was like, I can betray Jesus. What, 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 how much are you going to give me? And it was 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver nowadays? To tell you the truth, I don't know. I don't know that. That's a good question, though. I'm not sure what that would correlate to, to today's society. But so, 30 pieces of silver. That, that's how much Judas betrayed Jesus for. That's sad. But, so, we had the donkey which Jesus rode in with, and we had the 30 pieces of silver. Next week, what do you think we're going to find in the eggs? Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> but... It's a mystery. Yeah, we'll keep it a mystery. All right. Let's just have a word, real quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time this morning. And God, I thank you for these children that are up here. Yes. Father, I pray that you would just put a hedge of protection around their minds. Father, that you keep the world from influencing them. And instead, your Holy Spirit would just speak to them. Father, I pray that you be with us these next few weeks as we do this little series of, of children's lessons. God, I just ask that you be with these kids. Be with those that are working with them in Sunday school and in junior church. Just bless them. Give them wisdom. We love you and we praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys may go to junior church now. Oh, I love having the kids up. Although it's kind of
scary sometimes when you give a child a mic. You never know what they're going to say. So um, luckily, we, we were good today. Luckily, we were good today. But anyone, I know we already went through a praise and, and testimony, but anyone else have any type of praise or testimony that they would like to share? This morning, we're going to continue with the stepping up our game. If you recall last week, we were talking about stepping up our game and, and what that means. You know, it's usually, it's usually something that coaches tell their player when, when they're performing at an okay level. But hey, let's, let's just do a little bit more. Let's, let, let's just step it up just another notch. Let's just take it up another notch. And last week, what we were just talking about was fasting and praying. And if you recall, there was four reasons that we were covering why we fast, or why there was fasting, especially in the Bible. The first two reasons that we covered was for repentance and lamentation. And, and if you recall, we were talking about the story of Jonah, where Nineveh was repenting, and they were lamenting over their sins. And God heard them, and heard their cry out, saw all that their, their, their fast, and honored them and withheld the judgment that was coming. The next reason for fasting that we saw was for intervention. With this, we saw where there was this one who was demon-possessed. And the disciples, who weren't fasting at the time because Jesus was still with them, they weren't fasting at the time, couldn't cast out the demon, even though they had prayed. But Jesus came and delivered the, the individual from the demon. And the disciples went to him afterwards and said, Why couldn't we? Why couldn't we cast out the demon? And Jesus said to them, This kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. And so we are seeing how through fasting there is a sign, there, there is a type of, uh, of, of lim lim limitation where you're crying out. A repentance, but then there can be also a cry out to God. It can be on behalf of something. You're seeking a divine intervention. This week, we're going to look at the reasons three and four. The third reason was preparation. The fourth reason is worshiping or serving God. But this week, we were just covering this. This week, we're going to look at maybe you know, our battery. There we go. Preparation. And when we think of preparation, preparation is, the definition for preparation is prior to, or, or the, the reason for preparation with the fasting is prior to or engaging in dangerous activities such as a journey or battle. If you recall, when we were talking about fasting, there was two different definitions that was going on. And the one that Lexham says was prior to engaging, they would fast. Prior to engaging in dangerous activity such as a journey or battle. So preparation, by definition, is the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use or consideration. Being made ready for use. Now, preparation means you're actually putting time into it as well. So, just some things that it takes time to get prepared for. Driver's license. You have to actually put time into it. Even though sometimes it can come natural, nowadays, before you can take your driver's test, the, the, the driver, the, they want to see you have at least 30 to 50 hours behind the steering wheel before you'll even be able to sit for the test. There's preparation, 30 to 50 hours. To become an RN, to become a nurse, a registered nurse, two to four years of preparation to become a nurse. To become a nurse practitioner or, or a physician's assistant takes around six to eight years of preparation. A doctor? <laughs> twelve. Twelve years or eleven. Eleven to twelve years to prepare for what medical field you're going to enter into. And even depending on what your specialty is, it can take even longer than that. And that's preparing for an occupation. When I think of our armed forces, our armed forces prepare. They go through basic training. 
the Marines has the longest basic training, 13 weeks. 13 weeks for basic training. The Army's 10 weeks. Navy, eight weeks. Air Force, seven and a half. And now, I shouldn't laugh, but now we have something called Space Force. It's an offshoot of the Air Force, but seven and a half weeks of basic training too. But it's so important to have this preparation. Because could you imagine if you're in the ER in pain and you have someone that came in that says nurse and you're like, oh, how long were you in school? School, what's that? I didn't have to go to school. No, I'm not. What's wrong? Oh, you need an IV? Sure. Uh, let me read the instructions real quick. Yeah, there needs to be preparation. Or if you're going to a surgeon and the surgeon comes in because, you know, the surgeon always comes in to, you know, talk about the plan before surgery. And, and oh, well, how long was your residency? What's a residency? Uh, where did you go to school at? I graduated from Tarkenton. <laughs> Preparation. We like people to be prepared. Our military. Could you imagine if our military didn't have to have individuals go through basic training? And I mean, that's just basic training. There's more training beyond that. There's way more training beyond that. Drills and drills and different instructions that they have to sit through. But could you imagine if there was no basic training? and it came time for war or conflict and it came time to defend our nation, there would be no preparation. Well, now I want to talk about preparation that's a little bit different. Because that's talking about physical preparation. But how much more do we need to be spiritually prepared? In Ezra, we're going to be focusing a little bit more on the, 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 the physical aspect. But here in Ezra, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 21 and 23. But Ezra is talking about they're over in captivity, and they're talking about the return journey to back to Jerusalem, to help rebuild Jerusalem, help rebuild the temple, help rebuild the walls. And Ezra, just it's real quick. It's just real quick. Here in verse 21, it says, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. We're going to be playing with this a little bit today, I see. Verse 21, Ezra says, Then I proclaimed a fast. You see, they were already getting prepared for the journey. They were already getting prepared physically, packing things and everything like that. But there was something that they weren't doing yet. And that was preparing spiritually. Then I proclaimed a fast. And why were they proclaiming a fast? To seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. Now that term right way also means journey and it can also mean protection. So they know which way to go. Now, this journey that Ezra and, and the, the, those that were with him were going to go on, it wasn't a small journey at all. It was not a small journey. Uh, it was about 900 miles. They didn't have planes. They didn't have cars. Many of them weren't riding on donkeys either, or camels, but walking. 900 miles, just, just to give you an illustration, would be like walking from here down to Jacksonville, Florida. took them roughly about four months. So can you understand why there was a great need to prepare spiritually too and ask God for protection? I'm sure if Ezra wanted to, because Ezra had some respect from the king, I'm sure he could have asked the king, can you please give us an escort to keep us safe from, from the marauders, from the raiders, from those who wish to do ill? But he didn't. Instead, they fasted ahead of time. And prepar 
preparation for this travel. In preparation saying, God, this is what your will is for us. Okay, so protect us. Protect us that the world may know is what they were fasting about. They were fasting. And in verse 23 it says, So we fasted and entreated our God for this. This is the seeking of the right way. And I love this. It's very short. It's very short. I love verse 23. I mean, you, 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 he didn't go into any great detail or anything like that. He just said, we, we entreated our God for this. And it's simple. <laughs> he answered our prayer. It didn't go in a lot or anything. He just like, we asked him, and he answered. That's faith. That's faith. But another one of preparation is found in Matthew 4, 1 and 2. This takes place right after John the Baptist baptized Jesus Christ. We know this, where Jesus was going out into the wilderness. I want to break down just two verses in chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And verse 1 says this, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. To be tempted of the devil. Another word for tempted is also tested. Similar word, same word within the Greek. So one could say to be tested of the devil. You see, there was a test that was coming. And Jesus was going out into the wilderness. But then, verse 2 says this though, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. There was a preparation for the test though, because for the 40 days and 40 nights while he was in the wilderness, he was fasting and he was praying. You see, because Jesus was getting ready for the great ministry. A lot of times, they, they automatically attribute this, that he was fasting and getting prepared for the great ministry. Because realize, Jesus, he really only ministered for about three years. I mean, we, we see the four Gospels, and we see the miracles that he's done. We see the, the, the great sermons, and we forget that was only for three years. He did so much. And three years, he was so full of the Spirit. Well, one, he was 100% man, but he was 100% divine, too. And even though he was 100% divine, he still fasted. Because he was preparing for a test. He was preparing for a test. Now, when students, I should ask the kids, but when students are getting ready to take a test, they need to prepare and you can tell which are the students that are, I don't want to say good students, but more disciplined. Because they spent time preparing for a test. I mean, we, the week before college finals, you, you don't see too many college kids out on the campus gallivanting around. Because they're usually in their study groups, especially if it's like biology or chemistry or even English. I mean, there's so much studying that goes on. Mathematics, psychology, I don't even understand psychology. We're just going to move on. Anyways, uh, but there's so much study that takes place because they're preparing for the test. Jesus was preparing for the test where he was getting tried by Satan. He was being tested. Not only that, he was also preparing for the great ministry he was going to do. Something I found interesting, looking back at last week when Moses was up on Mount Sinai, he was fasting. 40 days, 40 nights. And he was also fasting because he was lamenting and asking for forgiveness on behalf of Israel. But you also realize he was fasting before he presented the law to Israel. Because the first time down the mountain, he was chastising them. The second time he came down with the law. So Moses was fasting 40 days and 40 nights before he presented the law. Jesus was fasting 40 days and 40 nights before he was presenting salvation. Before he was presenting the gospel. I just saw that, I'm like, that's, that's unique. So both those who were presenting were fasting, drawing close to God. 
So fasting can mean being prepared, means of preparation. But also, fasting can be for worship and serving God. Oftentimes we don't think of this. Oftentimes we think of, of fasting as a, as, a, as a desire to fulfill a need that we have. Well, guess what? We do have a need to draw closer to God. Amen. We have a need to draw closer to God. Now, this is a long, longer scripture. But Luke chapter 2, as soon as I start reading, everyone's going to be like, ah, I know where he's at. But Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 38 says this. <clears throat> and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just, was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. It can also be, think of, the redemption of Israel. But the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That was important to hear all that. That, that. that was important to hear all what Simeon had to say. But now pay attention to Anna. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. Anna was a righteous individual. You see, later on in the New Testament, we hear of Paul, when Paul's talking about the widows and what they should be doing, they say supplication and prayer. A widow should be uh, taken care of in prayer and, fa and supplication before God. But here, before those letters are even written, we see Anna, who's been a widow for a great many years, not leaving the temple, but day and night she's praying. Now, does it mean she was fasting that whole time, day and night? No, but she was taking time to fast. And why was she doing it? She was doing it to serve God. She was doing it out of service to him. She was doing it because she loved him. She was doing it because this last verse here in 38, it says, looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She was doing it because she was also seeking out the redemption of Jerusalem. When we see this verse, the, the verse 37, if, there we go. <laughs> Fasting and prayers. She was serving God with her fasting and her prayers. Service is also a form of worship. We don't think of that often when we're thinking of serving God. Matter of fact, in Sunday school this morning, we were talking about when we're hands and feet of Christ. When we're being the hands and feet of Christ, going and serving those around us, whether it be visiting those who are sick, uh, helping mowing. Whenever we put love into action, it's actually a form of worship. It's a form of yeah. worship. And so we can serve God and we can worship God in our fastings and in our prayers. But as a result of this, just like Simeon, she also was able to see the Christ. She also saw and beheld the redemption of Jerusalem. 
She saw the salvation of Jerusalem. The salvation of mankind. The Christ child. You see, because she was so faithful in her worship to God, so faithful in her service to God, God was honoring her. And she beheld the child. She saw the child. I can just see this in the temple playing out where, where you have Joseph and Mary and Simeon sees him and, and goes up to them and, and, and takes the child and, and starts blessing. But he's saying it out loud. So now everyone else that's in the sanctuary, everyone else that's in the temple courts can hear Simeon. And all of a sudden, Anna, he, she hears it and she walks over. Because you read in 36, it says, Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. She great age had lived. And, and this woman was a widow, but served God. But coming in that instant, right then, as sign Simeon was holding, Coming in at that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord. She gave thanks to the Lord. Because everything that she was serving, everything that she was seeking, God just revealed and showed the Christ child and showed the salvation that was coming to man. Fasting in a form of worship. Fasting in a form of serving God. So when we think about it, the fasting for repentance and lamentation, the fasting for praying for divine intervention, the fasting for preparation, the fasting for worship and serving. You don't really have to break it all down because one thing, even the most righteous man, and I'm saying man, I'm not saying Jesus, even the most righteous man, he's always, whenever he's going before God, God, thank you for forgiving me a sinner. There's a form of repentance in his prayer right there. God, help me to stay strong in my faith. There's a prayer for intervention and a prayer for preparation right there. And oftentimes when they're praying, there's a form of worship or serving. Father, help me know your will, for you are almighty. Help me to be able to serve those around me. Help me to serve you, God. I want to draw close to you. I want to serve you. So yes, we can break up the four different reasons, and there's more. There's more than that. But those, those are some of the, the main reasons that we are able to see in the Scripture for fasting. But really, they all can kind of mesh back together for one. They all can kind of mesh back together for one. And so now, we can come to this question when we're talking about fasting. Are we to fast? Are we to fast? Is there an actual command in the Bible that says, Thou shalt fast. You know, some might think fasting's for others, but I don't necessarily have to do it. I'm, I'm not comfortable where I'm at. Well, remember the verse that I quoted last week in, in, in Luke 5, 35, when Jesus was questioned about his disciples, why they weren't fasting. But yet John the Baptist's disciples were fasting, and the Pharisees would fast. Jesus said this, though. He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. It doesn't work for some reason this morning. But it says, then they will fast, is what the bullet's supposed to be. They will fast. Matthew Henry says, though there is no doubt that Jesus and his disciples lived in a spare and frugal manner, it would be improper for his disciples to fast while they had the comfort of his presence. When he is with them, all is well. The presence of the sun makes day, and its absence produces night. What Matthew Henry was alluding to is there was going to be a time when the sun was now sitting at the right hand of the Father. The, the, the sign out front says, Winter blues, bask in the sun. Okay? Sometimes, yes, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. But how in tune with the Spirit are we? How in tune are we with the Spirit? You see, Jesus was going to be leaving. He was going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And so that's how come he said there's going to be a time when the bridegroom leaves, when Jesus leaves. That's when they'll fast. That's when they're going to set aside and abstain and seek God's will to draw closer to him. 
That's what the fasting was about. But Jesus said, then they will fast. Notice he didn't say, then they might fast. Just saying, then they will fast. You know, some also say, well, do we really need a period of fasting? Because we have the Holy Spirit living within us. I want to look at one other account of Christ's baptism, well, his baptism, but his, his temptation, and that's Luke uh, chapter 4, 1 and 2. Uh, I'm just going to read really verse 1. If you have the scriptures, you can turn there, but listen to what it says. Remember, Jesus, Jesus fasted for 40 days. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. If Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, and yet he went into the wilderness to fast, I don't think there's any excuse we can have to say, oh, I'm, I'm content where I'm at. I don't think I need to fast. Did you catch it? Because Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know some are going to be like, well, yes, but sir, but, but, but pastor, he, he was getting ready to be tempted by Satan. Who here has not been tempted by Satan? Yeah, I kind of thought. Every day we get tested by Satan. Are we prepared? Now, am I saying that we need to be fasting every day or every week or every month? Absolutely. I'm not telling you anything. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. But this is one thing that we don't hear much about. In churches these days, you don't hear much about them saying, well, we need to fast. We need to fast. Not in many churches do you hear that. But you know what? Satan likes that. Because what fasting does is it forces you out of your comfort zone. And when you get out of your comfort zone, you have to rely on the Holy Spirit more. When you get out of your comfort zone... It draws you closer to God when you're seeking Him. And when you draw closer to God, there's a shaking that occurs. Amen? Amen. There's a shaking that occurs. But you know what? Fasting is more than just abstaining. <clears throat> Fasting is more than just abstaining. You, you, well, let me read this real quick in Isaiah 58. Thank you. In Isaiah 58, 3 and 8, I want to read this real quick. Fasting is more than just abstaining. So listen to what listen to what the children of Israel were saying here. They asked, Why have we fasted? They say, and you have not seen. Why have we afflicted our souls? And you have not taken notice. This is what they were saying to God. Listen to God's response. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. And to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Listen to what the Bible scholar Jones has to say about this. He, they said, the people ask why it is when, uh, why it is that when they fasted, God did not pay any attention. It does not hear their prayers. And God replies that it is because they are not fasting for the right purpose. But while they are fasting, they go about their own affairs with even more diligence. You see, they were doing an action. They were doing an action, but their heart wasn't in it. Continuing with verse 5 in chapter 58, he says, Is it a fast, this is God speaking, Is it a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush? And to be spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast? And an acceptable day to the Lord? If you just stop right there, that sounds a lot like what Nineveh did. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it sounds good, right? It, it looks like it should be a fast. I would consider that a fast, right? But something was missing. Something was missing. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, the Lord says? It says, to loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is, this, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, 
and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Listen now. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Listen to how Joel puts it in Joel chapter 2. He says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and mourning. But listen, so rend your heart. Rend your heart. Not your garments. Not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. You see, fasting is with action of the heart. Fasting is with action of the heart. If you recall, last week I made mention of how some, when they, when they enter a Lenten season, they think of the, the fasting. And they'll give up comforts. Instead of drinking hot coffee, they're going to drink lukewarm coffee. Because they desire hot coffee, but they're going to suffer. But when they're doing that, when they're doing that, what they are doing is basically saying, I've heard it put this way, I'm proving that one prefers to satisfy God rather than ourselves, or to prove love of Jesus. So they're saying that, that that's almost getting into a workspace. They're going to do action A to prove that they love God. The issue with that is fasting is not just to prove. You see, one should be fasting to seek God and to draw closer to Him. If you're just doing an action, in action, that's works. If, if you think, if I just if I just do this, then and go about my business. I mean, we saw what Isaiah in Isaiah what it was saying is they were fasting and they were doing all the right formulas. They were tearing their clothes and everything, and it, it appeared, but their heart was not in the right place. Why? Because they were not focusing on God. They were just going through the action. Shall I say sometimes how some of us me in the church in the world today go through the action of coming to church on Sundays. But is their heart really in it? Are they really coming to church because they want to draw closer to God? Or are they just going through the action of going to church because, hey, if I go through the action of going to church, that's good enough. You see, that's what they were doing in Isaiah. They were just going through the action of fasting, renting their clothes, sackcloth, but their heart wasn't there. Because as soon as they were done, they went about their daily business. There was no seeking God. So I asked the question, what might happen if we fast? What might happen if we choose to fast? You know, one of the things that we can look at, you know, we recall when Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he was fasting and he was spending all that time with God, drawing close to God. Do you recall when he came down from the mount, how his face shone? He drew close to God. He wanted to see God so much. God wouldn't let him. God allowed him to see the back, but not the front. He, he, he allowed him to see a little bit of him. But he was drawing so close to God because of that fast that was going on. What would that look like today? Can you imagine what that would look like today? I can't. It's hard to fathom. I mean, the people were scared of Moses when they saw him. I mean, I've seen some pretty scary people sometimes, but not because of that. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. The news just. But the thing is, what would happen if we chose to fast? You know, fasting doesn't have to be food either. It doesn't have to be edible or, or, or a drink. But what a fast is, is when you're abstaining from something else, because you have a greater desire to draw closer to God. You have a greater desire to seek Him more. Fasting is more than just action. It's with the heart. Psalms 
51, 16 and 17, it's kind of familiar. But remember what we said, it's, in, it's part of this creating me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. It's part of that chapter. But listen, it says, For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Well, wait a minute. Weren't, didn't God command them to burn, uh, have sacrifices and burnt offerings? Yeah, he did. But the people just started doing it as an action. Same thing as fasting. People do it just sometimes as an action. But listen, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. It's a heart issue. It's a heart matter. What, what's the reason for it? In your heart, are you truly trying to draw closer to God? Or are you just going to go through this action so you can say, Oh yeah, I fast. I mean, I can't help but think of the Pharisees that are, you know, the, the, the self-righteousness that exudes from the Pharisees, you know. Oh, I pray, and I fast, and I, look at me, I'm, I'm a good Christian. No, no. We need to be praying and seeking God so that we can draw closer to Him. Amen. You see, this is what I'm talking about when I said stepping up our game. Because so many times... the. I'm going to close with a song, and if you have your hymns, go to hymn books, you can go ahead and start, start turning to page 702, which is a little chorus, fill my cup, Lord. You see, there are many times where if someone is thirsty, they might be satisfied with having a glass half full. Sometimes as Christians, I feel like, some, especially personally, I felt... At times, I might have been satisfied with my spiritual glass, half full. You see, God was with me. I was going through the motions. Everything, I, you know, yeah, I knew I was wanting to draw closer to God. But was I really putting forth the effort? Was I really putting forth the, the, the energy into drawing close, closer to God? Or was I just kind of giving Him the leftovers? Was I giving Him the first fruits? Or was I just giving Him the leftovers? Nancy, if you would come forward. As we get ready to sing this song, fasting is not just for those who are in need of repentance. Fasting is not just for those who are preparing for, for some great mission journey or, or, or mission trip. But fasting can also be for, God, I want to know you better. God, I want to serve you more. God, is there anything within me that is keeping me, that's hindering me from drawing close to you? Please reveal it to me. As we get ready to sing this song, Fill My Cup, Lord, I just want to say this, the altar's open. And this altar call is, this altar call is not, for, not for those who are doing anything wrong, but the altar call is, do you have a greater desire in your heart to draw closer to God? See, for some reason, in the churches, the altar has come a place where only sinners go to. That's what people think. is Oh, the altar's only for, for those who are, are sinning. But no, the altar can be a place where you just want to meet with God. Now, can you meet with God in the, in the pews? Absolutely you can. But there's something when you put forth that action. It's almost like a baptism. When you're publicly announcing, yes, I believe God is my Savior, Christ lives within my heart. Something about this altar is about, God, I want to have a closer relationship with you. God, I, I, I want to love you more and more every day. Holy Spirit, I want you to take over my life. I want you to fill me now. So the altar is open. The altar is always open. But the altar is open, especially as we close this morning. And if the Holy Spirit is drawing you to draw closer, I invite you to come forward. It, don't, don't, let it, don't let it bother you what your neighbor might think or anything. This is just between you and God, between you and the Holy Spirit. But I tell you what, Satan is attacking the church these days. Satan is attacking the church these days. And we need to have more of God. We need to have more of the Holy Spirit in us, as in we need to allow more of the Holy Spirit to take over us. Yes. That's what the need is. So if you would, please stand with me.
And in your hymnals, turn to page 702 as we get ready to sing this little chorus. Father, in Jesus' heavenly name, amen. 